hello and welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Professor Charlotte O'Brien. I'm from York Law School here at the University of York and I'll be chairing today's event. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome you in person today and also welcome our audience online. This year's York Festival of Ideas programme with a theme of the next chapter brings together a range of world-class speakers, exhibitions, performances, and a host of stimulating and interactive experiences for people of all ages, including York residents and visitors to the city. The ethos of the festival is to make it accessible and available to everyone. And therefore, the vast majority of events are free of charge, making us one of the biggest free festivals in the UK. Now, before I introduce you to our panellists and the topic for our discussion today, uh, please can you just note the evacuation slide on the screen? I'm assured it's on the screen. There we go. <laughs> Perfect timing. In the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the steward's instructions and evacuate the venue via a closest available exit. Um, can I also ask you to put your phones on silent for this session, please? Right. So thank you for joining us for this panel discussion, which is presented in collaboration with the Morell Centre for Legal and Political Philosophy, which is generously supported by the C and JB Morell Trust. Today, we'll explore the multiple social, economic, political and cultural factors contributing to the rise of the radical right across Europe. Acute inequality has been sharpened by the recent pandemic leaving many feeling abandoned, while the far right's promise of misleadingly simple solutions and shared enemies has gathered support. Those enemies include the establishment, liberal democracy, which, for example, allows women bodily autonomy, and also the other, be it other nationalities, other races, other religions, other cultures, even other sexual orientations. In this session, we'll be asking, in the aftermath of the global pandemic, the ongoing war in Ukraine, and the Euroscepticism underpinning and ricocheting from Brexit, can we seize the opportunity to build safer, fairer societies? Or are these events unleashing a new and unstoppable wave of right-wing populism and authoritarianism? What are the risks of far-right governments and others seeking to destabilise democracy across Europe? To explore these questions, I'm delighted to introduce our expert panel of public intellectuals. Each speaker will give a short presentation before coming together for a panel discussion, during which we'll delve deeper into the discussion and invite you, the audience, including you, the audience online, to ask questions too. So to our keynote speaker, Michael Ignatieff is a distinguished academic, a former Canadian MP and leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. As provost of the Central European University in Hungary, Michael fought against a legislative manoeuvre that attacked its livelihood and which ultimately forced, uh, uh, forcibly displaced the institution, which has now made a new home in Vienna. Michael's recent book, on consolation, finding solace in dark times, examines the question of how we can console ourselves and each other in an age of unbelief. Michael, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I gave a lecture at the, on toleration at the Morrell Center, so I have a a great feeling of respect and, and gratitude to the center and to the Morell family. So that's the first thing to say. It's very good to be here with my Polish colleague, the Brit here. And above all, above all, our colleague from Kharkiv University. She's the person you must listen to most carefully. And, we, um, and it's a little moment of solidarity with um, a fine university that is under attack, and we should never forget that this is not normal. Um, she should be in a normal world where her right to study and think and teach is not 
subject to bombardment, intimidation, violence, and terror. So there you go. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Hungary. Um, I'm a Canadian. I was asked to be, I was crazy enough to leave Harvard in 2016 to become president of Central European University, a serious social science and humanities graduate school that had been in Vienna for 30 years and was set up by the financier George Soros, a Holocaust survivor and Hungarian national. Uh, he set up the university in 1990 to assist the transition from closed societies to open societies. It was a rather brilliant idea that, that if you wanted to create democratic freedom, you had to create free institutions. And so we were supposed to be the intellectual incubator of a transition to free inquiry in Central and Eastern Europe. And in a modest way, we did just that. Um, and we helped to train what could be called the transition elite, people who had been um, uh, grown up under communism at places called Karl Marx University and needed to have the skills to pilot the country into a democratic and also capitalist future. Um, and so that was our job, and we turned out 18 to 20,000 graduates, um, not just Hungarians, but recruited from 120 countries, including Poland, including Britain, um, including all of the countries of the post-Soviet uh, space, especially Ukrainians and Russians. One of the things the university prouded itself on was to have Ukrainians and Russians in the same classroom, to have Bosnians, Serbs, and Croats in the same classroom during the, during the horrible Balkan Wars. So that's the university. <clears throat> when I took over, uh, Viktor Orban had been in uh, power uh, since 2010. And uh, he had proclaimed that he was not a liberal democrat, he was an illiberal democrat. Um, and we need to pause and think about what that means. What does illiberal democracy mean? It may simply be a contradiction in terms. Um, an illiberal, an illiberal democrat is someone who believes that democracy is majority rule, period. And the winning party, in his case, Fidesz, represents the people. And li the liberal part of liberal democracy is constitutional courts. We've got a lawyer here, so he knows you, another lawyer. Right? Uh, liberal democracy means all the counter-majoritarian institutions that balance majority rule. Uh, the counter-majoritarian institutions that balance majority rule in your society, in my society, Canada, are a free press, constitutional courts, independent regulators, professional associations, and universities. The function of a university is um, not a direct political actor, but we are the key validators of what constitutes as knowledge in a free society. And we do so through debate and argument and shouting and screaming at each other and eventually getting a canon of things that we think are as true as we can make them, okay? So that's our contribution to a free society. And all of this adds up to the counter-majoritarian balances that, in my view, keep a society free. And a democracy is um, power, balancing power, to keep the people free. That's how I would define democracy. It's not majority rule, is what I'm saying to you. But Viktor Orban's view of democracy is that it's majority rule pure and simple, and because he won a successive series of mandates, now five straight election victories, he speaks for the people. He represents the people, and he has waged a systemic attack on counter-majoritarian institutions, meaning He's gerrymandered the Constitution, rewritten the Constitution, um, uh, neutered the Constitutional Court, um, t 
turned the entire free media over to his cronies. So there, there are free, there's free argument, free debate in Hungary, but 90% of the population, as in Putin's Russia, gets all of their information from state media. This is the, an emergent model of an authoritarian state of a kind that we haven't seen in Europe. It's different from Putin's Russia, which is, again, nominally a democracy and in reality is anything but. But in Putin's Russia, there is police terror and there is killing. Boris Nemtsov is shot with inside of the Kremlin walls. Um, a great, uh, great journalists have been killed uh, going home in their apartments. So a direct deployment of police terror in, uh, in, um, in Orban's Hungary, there are no political prisoners and there is no direct police terror. You can get up in a Hungarian restaurant after a nice Hungarian meal and denounce Orban roundly in public and basically nobody gives a damn. Um, so you have freedom, but it's been emptied of its capacity to have any echo. Um, and this is another feature of this system that's remarkable. Um, I don't, so the authoritarian right has flocked to Hungary because this model is for export. This is not just a story about a little country that you may have visited and know only for paprika and Bartok and some other nice things. Um, this is a country that is now exporting this model majoritarian, authoritarian democracy based on single party dominance. Um, without police terror, but uh, substituting for direct police terror, constant, intimidating, 24 seven control of the public media. With a creation of a politics of enemies, which is very important. Um, he mobilizes the base in Hungary by choosing his enemies carefully and mobilizing the, the base on the, on the basis of, of creating these enemies, these external enemies. So the European Union, <coughs> it's wonderful stuff. You run against the European Union Monday through Friday and you call it the equivalent of Moscow, right? Brussels is the Moscow tyranny threatening to undermine the sovereignty of poor little Hungary. You do that. And then on Saturday and Sunday, you cash the checks. <laughs> A crucial feature of this formation, and this is not meant to give aid and comfort to Brexiteers, but we were talking in a previous section about enlargement. Uh, as these countries came into the European Union, they were put through the ringer of the enlargement process, as Poland was. But once enlargement is completed and you've done all the, the yaki, then the leverage that the European Union has over the domestic political arrangements of these countries immediately drops away. And Essentially, Orban has used a 4.5 million euro annual structural transfer into Hungary from you know, French taxpayers and German taxpayers and Italian taxpayers to subsidize a crony capitalist regime that steals everything that isn't bump, you know, bolted down. So in a very real way, in a very disturbing way, the European Union is a complicit abettor of an authoritarian regime that is antithetical to everything the European Union stands for. And this is said to you by someone who's a pretty strong pro-European. But the institutions have backed themselves into a complicity with right-wing authoritarianism, which is deeply disturbing. And now we see another feature of this, the international dimension, which is, Orban is Vladimir Putin's best friend in Europe and in NATO. So you have to run an European Union and a NATO council 
with a country that is reluctant or in fact refused to ship any weapons to Ukraine, which increases the risk in all the remaining pipes. So the poor old Poles have to shovel all the weapons into Ukraine, whereas if you had a, you had a Hungarian port that would diminish the risk to Poland, it would be an important demonstration of solidarity to the Ukrainians. It's not happening. Um, I'm coming to a conclusion, I promise. But I, 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 my little story, the reason I'm here to tell you, is that in 2016, this is about the politics of enemies, Viktor Orban faced a re-election in which he decided to select an enemy. And he selected George Soros, the founder of my university, as his enemy. He said, my entire election campaign between now and April 2018 will be to drive George Soros out of, out of uh, Europe, uh, out of, out of uh, Hungary. He then introduced a bill which rendered our university, which had been there for 30 years and was in all international rankings the best university in Europe and what, the best university in Hungary and one of the best universities in Europe, he rendered our operations illegal in Hungary overnight. The thing to notice is the use of law, the rule of law. It, the legislation that made us illegal in Hungary looks like law, walks like law, talks like law, and is a piece of pure administrative arbitrariness Right? has no relation to law whatever. It's a manipulated use of law that destroys law. Um, we, were then, we then fought, we then roused an international campaign. York was one of the signatories of letters to protest this absurd and grotesque infringement of our academic freedom. But, you know, as the country and western song says, you know, I fought the law and the law won. You know, you can't can the end of the day fight the law. So eventually, um, we had to uh, move the uh, university from, uh, from Budapest to um, uh, uh, Vienna. A final feature of this authoritarian populism, the attack on the rule of law, the attack on academic freedom, the attack on a free press, is that it is for export just recently, the biggest American conservative association held its meeting in Budapest. People love this stuff. Strong government, um, hostility to elites. Notice that it's elites who run the counter-majoritarian institutions. So an attack on spoiled, privileged, cosmopolitan elites is a covert way of attacking the counter majoritarian institutions they defend, the courts, the free press, these quarrelsome, meddlesome academics. You attack the elite, but what you're actually doing is attacking the counter majoritarian institutions that keep you free. Um, yes, this is my trade union. I'm speaking on behalf of my trade union, the elites. But we're a counter-majoritarian force whose purpose is to enhance the freedom of all. That's what we're here for. These guys in the conservative authoritarian right have understood that this uh, attack on the uh, uh, on uh, counter-majoritarian elites is extremely popular. And finally, it has a deeply anti-Semitic tone to it. George Soros nearly died in the Holocaust. Throughout the campaign against George Soros, he, they ran a poster which is on every single billboard in Budapest for 18 months that said, don't let George Soros have the last laugh. Anybody who knows anything about anti-Semitic propaganda knows that the laughing Jew is the oldest figure of Nazi propaganda in the 1930s. Go to the York Library and find the Volkische Bulbachter of 1934, and you will see the laughing Jew. Now, the interesting thing about this is that Orban is personally not anti-Semitic. That's not what I'm saying. This is an anti-Semitism of the 21st century that denies that it is, that uses anti-Semitic tropes and then looks you in the face and says, how dare you accuse me of anti-Semitism? So this is, gives you some flavor of the sophistication and complexity of this ideological formation. But I guess I'm here to say, don't think this is happening far away. This is a spectacle that could be playing in 
somewhere in a theater near you sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, I have to uh, escape the fact that one of my takeaway points from that is elites of the world unite. Um, <laughs> um, it is now my enormous pleasure to introduce Dr. Yaroslav Kuch, a political analyst and essayist and editor-in-chief of the Polish weekly Kultura Liberalna, which I'm sure translates as uh, liberal culture. Yaroslav is also a policy fellow in the Centre for Science and, po Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. He regularly writes for The Guardian, The New York Times, and Le Monde, and has a column in Die Tageszeitung. Um, testing my GCSE German <laughs> pronunciation there, not very good. He is an assistant professor at the University of Warsaw and a visiting scholar at the Columbia Law School and University of Chicago Law School. He was also co-director of the Knowledge Bridges Poland-Britain-Europe project, St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford, between 2016 and 2018. We're thrilled to have him with us to discuss the work of Kultura regarding policies and actions taking place in Poland. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, there are so many topics that we could uh, touch upon, but uh, let me start perhaps to, to follow up what you said. Uh, uh, we tend to put uh, Orban and Kaczynski into one basket. It's, it's very uh, rare to see other patterns of seeing those two politicians. Rightly so, they have a lot of uh, in common. They, they meet each other from time to time, and they are making some plans behind the scenes because those meetings are not open to public, which tells us a lot. Uh, but, but, again, we started this day with talking about the war in Ukraine, and this uh, turned out to be a huge dividing line between the two politicians. In fact, when we take a closer look, uh, they, there are differences between Kaczynski and Orban, definitely so. They are not political twins, as one tend to think. But uh, it's only now that we could really see the whole scale of differences, and they are not tiny ones. Uh, the main point of departure of political thinking in the, uh, in the region of Central and Eastern Europe, but perhaps rather of those who are close, direct neighbors of Russia, is different from other countries. We tend to think about the existential threat to the state. This is something that in this country could be hardly understood, I believe so, and lucky you. Mm -hmm. uh, because if we, if uh, to, 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 with a kind of oversimplification, I could say we could divide human experiences into three categories. Human exper experience of living in a state. One is that you live in a state that never collapses. I mean, that is, has a kind of continuity. Of course, it changes, but it has a kind of continuity over centuries. Then you have a second possibility. You live in a country that underwent some turbulences that changed its form radically, but still there is a kind of continuity to be observed. And the third part, and this is an experience of our, experience, of our region, but not only, is the experience of discontinuity, the existential threat that is posed to a state, and it is engraved in your culture so deeply that in fact it's a part of your identity. If you make a comparison with France, at the moment when they have their starting point of national identity is the revolution, French, great French Revolution. At the very same time, we have Polish experience, which is the collapse of the state. And one could tend to think that it's only about history, not really. This is exactly about how we interpret today the war in Ukraine. Because the experience, the existential threat, is, the, is uh, a cultural code 
that this was repeated over and over, not as a kind of myth about something that happened in the 18th century or 19th century or 20th century. No, it's a, it's a repeating experience, a kind of a cycle. If you take a look from the outside, you could call it a sphere of influence. Uh, and therefore, what we see now is the, 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 that after 30 years of uh, freedom, the existential threat, fear, and it's a real one, came back to the region. Very often we are asked the question, why, what's going on with this country? Uh, you were against the refugees one year ago, and all of a sudden, I mean, and that was about, I don't remember a number, but let's say 1,000 or perhaps 10,000 people. And you take three millions of people in three months overnight, mm -hmm. What's wrong with you? Uh, well, this is, you, there are obviously, you, you could explain it in many ways, but the, the, the main thing is that the existential threat was, was one of the main factors here. And uh, that's one of the differences between Poland and Hungary, that Hungarians do not have, they don't, at least by now, they don't share this existential threat experience. Whereas Poles, uh, tend to think like Estonians, like even Finns, mm -hmm. like Ukrainians, obviously. Why? Because the, the, the bottom line of this uh, social society, because not really the government, but the social so society movement to welcome refugees was founded on a, a very simple uh, phrase, that, uh, that, uh, the, the phrase that was really on many lips, was we will be next. And then, we, if we could return to the question of framing that experiences help us to understand what is going on now, is that it could be translated in how we perceive the war in Ukraine and how we react and what outcome we would like to see. So, to make this long story short, when in the West we tend to, to think that the conflict might spill over the Ukraine, and Joe Biden was uh, uh, talking about uh, a global nuclear conflict at the beginning, that was rarely heard in the region. In the region we tend to think that, uh, uh, in fact, this is the war is a link in a chain. This is not an event per se that could be stopped. It's a process. And he, it, I believe this is still a difference in, 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 the, in, the, in the framing of the conflict. Is it a, a, a single event and therefore we could react to, to it in such a manner because of the rising living costs? Or it's a chain of events since the Second Chechenia War, for instance, and therefore we should be ready for more economic sacrifices. If we take the data from Poland and other countries, you could see the difference. For instance, we had the presidential elections in France and the uh, main uh, subject that preoccupied Frenchmen was the, that was 55 55% was the cost of living. And the Ukrainian war, after a while, fell to 15%, more or less. At the same time, for Poles, it was like 80 to 90%. The Ukrainian war was the main subject, uh, political subject. So, an event or a process. Then, again, political actions that are taken due to this interpretation. In the region, Poles, Ukrainians, the Baltic countries tend to ask for more radical steps. They believe, and again a difference, they believe that we are already at war. This is not the conflict that happened on, in February. This is the conflict that is against our values, our lifestyles, our liberal values, by the way, which could be seen at the moment when you regained a territory of Ukraine, and then you see the difference. What happened in Bucha and afterwards. 
enough as an example. So you expect political actions that are more, more direct, and this is, I believe, a, a tragic dilemma to conclude. Because, in fact, uh, the outcome that is expected is different. Uh, we are talking about not humiliating Russia, for instance, Macron and not only him. But in the region, I believe, I assume, that we tend to think that we would like to put Russia in 1991. You see the difference. This is a huge difference because we, we expect different outcomes, I believe, within the NATO countries, within the EU countries. Uh, and uh, therefore, Saying that, I believe that our aim, also you asked about what, what we do, I believe that our aim is to communicate better with, between each other as to these different perspectives. Uh, because one thing that Mr. Putin wants, uh, wants uh, for NATO partner, partners to be divided. He would like to divide us. At the beginning, it was because of the nuclear threat. or Now it may be because of the costs of living. But still, the, the goal is the same. And he's very patient. He's very patient. So uh, yeah, the, the, the fact re remains that, that the, C, uh, the Central European and, and, uh, and uh, Central Europe and uh, 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 countries, they um, would like to, to involve the NATO and EU partners on a broader scale in the conflict while at least a part of the public opinion of the West Coast continues to prioritize the global peace and would like to, to froze the conflict as soon as possible. I believe this is a tragic dilemma. It's just the beginning, but we should talk about it in order to communicate within our camp so as not to be divided. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to say, um, noting that uh, questions are already coming in, do ask them online, um, and when we get to questions, I will try and incorporate them as well as questions in the room. Um, right, so, Dr. Heli uh, Tirma Clark should be joining us online um, on Zoom. Heli is director of the Digital Society Institute at the European School of Management and Technology in Berlin. She previously served as ambassador for cyber diplomacy and director general for the cyber diplomacy department at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She set up EU strategic level cyber dialogues with the US, India, Brazil, Japan, South Korea, China, and kicked off EU global cyber capacity building programs, steering the development of the EU cyber diplomacy toolbox to bolster European response to malicious cyber activities. In 2011, she was assigned to the NATO international staff to prepare the NATO cyber defense policy. She has held various managerial academic positions at the Estonian Ministry of Defence and the Tallinn University since 1995. She was a Fulbright Scholar at the George Washington University and has published in several academic journals throughout her career. I think you'll agree that she is pretty much the foremost person in the world to be able to talk to us about the threat of cyber insecurity. Over to you, Heli. Um, hello, uh, and I'm very glad to be part of uh, your festival, and thank you for inviting me. There is maybe one in interesting fact uh, from my CV, which was not uh, reflected in your um, introduction. I am one of those uh, Estonians who graduated Central European University in 1996 in political science department. So I remember uh, still our um, um, campus in Budapest, and I am also very sad that it, uh, it is closed now. And, and hopefully we will see in the future another campus of the CU uh, in Budapest. Uh, so, and thanks for Professor Ignatiev uh, for fighting for, for this um, course, because I believe that this uh, education uh, for um, different societies and open societies is still crucial. Um, uh, I am um, uh, concentrating in my today's uh, intervention on the role of internet and social media when it comes to the 
radicalization um, of the groups in society, because I believe the um, heading of our panel was radical right, right? But I also talk about internet freedom and also what uh, role technology has played um, in um, different um, activities in Europe. And of course, as I have been the cybersecurity policymaker for the past 15 years, uh, turned into cyber policymaker after 2007 um, large scale attacks against Estonia uh, as an as an I am Estonian national, so I can talk a bit also about cyber uh, insecurity. Um, first of all, let me maybe start with the um, uh, realization that um, although internet was uh, certainly created to uh, facilitate the free flow of information, and it has created condition where freedom of expression um, has been spreading very fast throughout the different continents. Um, unfortunately, we now see the trend that um, more and more um, governments are closing their internet space and um, the digital authoritarianism that um, uh, countries like China and Russia have been championing is spreading faster than we would like to see this happening in our liberal democracies. And um, we always thought that internet uh, is this um, domain of um, free um, expression and uh, free flow of information. But now we see that more and more uh, technology helps uh, the authoritarian governments sometimes to um, assert control over different groups in society. Uh, even further, uh, Technology and social media also have played the role in recent rise of radical right in our democratic societies, also helped by some of the not so liberal countries. Uh, we, of course, have uh, famous examples of election interference uh, in 2016 um, uh, in the United States, also in France, Germany and other European countries. Uh, but we also have been seeing how um, information has become weaponized product by some of the uh, radical fragmented groups in society and, and how this has, has been um, one of the reasons why our societies are um, getting more polarized and um, it would be also um, easier for those from outside to uh, interfere in our democratic processes. So. Um, the fake news, disinformation, inciting hatred and sowing discord have been, of course, uh, part of Russian playbook for a long time. And social media and Internet have been used uh, by the different uh, groups um, in uh, Russian uh, intelligence services um, to um, also destabilize European countries and uh, other democracies um, around the world. Uh, what we have been doing uh, in order to um, mitigate this. Uh, the European governments, in fact, um, maybe have not been very fast uh, to wake up to cyber and disinformation threat, but they have uh, by now, all of them uh, created certain um, coordination and the policies and measures in order to fight with disinformation and cyber attacks. Um, on this information, there are uh, different services and groups, and sometimes also civil society helps them, uh, helps the governments to mitigate um, challenges and um, to address the uh, different disinformation um, campaigns that are orchestrated by um, uh, foreign powers and sometimes also domestic powers. Um, on the cyber uh, front, we have uh, been building the cyber resilience policies in the European Union and NATO since 2008-2009. Uh, and uh, I have been part of uh, the processes in the European Union uh, since um, uh, 2010. Uh, and um, I think uh, on the policy front, we have most um, of our preparations in place now. We have um, information sharing mechanisms and uh, cyber diplomacy toolbox that allows us to attribute cyber attacks to uh, hostile governments. We have been launching sanctions against Russian, um, Chinese and North Korean hackers, state sponsored, of course. And, um, and we have been uh, calling and out and naming and shaming different groups uh, in Russian intelligence services, uh, organizing um, 
uh, cyber attacks, uh, for instance, the latest um, uh, um, sanctions we applied uh, before German elections uh, as the EU. Uh, uh, and and we, ha we have been doing some useful steps. Of course, uh, critics could say that, yes, it's too little and too late. And uh, I think in a way it's true, but uh, I also have been um, in the position to explain to politicians what exactly are those issues that we have to fight with, how to address this. And it is not always easy in our democratic societies either to explain all this complexity that the internet and technology have been bringing to us. Uh, and uh, the layer of the strategic thinkers in this field is still very small. That's why I switched to um, university again. So my aim is to build um, uh, a very good strategic cyber school in Berlin and uh, create a new generation of uh, cyber and technology leaders in Europe. Um, but um, uh, additionally, what Europe has been doing in order to fight the um, um, power of the social media and uh, also trying to <clears throat> diminish the uh, destabilization attempts in our um, uh, technological space. Um, recently, European Union has adopted Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act. So those are two quite important, maybe a bit complex, but very important regulations because it's the first time that one of them, large governmental groups, is taking on large technology com um, conglomerates that seem to be not accountable to any democratic body. So um, I think it's the European policymakers that are now trying to have some balance um, uh, here. And uh, very briefly, I will end my presentation with uh, going through some of the key um, elements, what the Digital Services Act is going to do once applied in Europe, but hopefully also it, it will have the global element. First, um, we will have um, more responsible online platforms where European Commission and member states can have access to the algorithms of uh, very large online platforms so that they can um, uh, remove if uh, uh, they are sure that there is illegal content online or products or services. I think for disinformation campaigns, it's very important that there is a legal basis to remove some of the content um, and act quickly as well. So um, the fundamental rights should be protected with these measures and there should be stronger safeguards to ensure that um, notices are processed um, in an effective manner. Um, also the viol uh, victims of cyber violence will be helped in more, uh, more efficient manner there will be penalties for online platforms and search engines uh, if they do not comply with these rules. And there will be also um, a, a set of measures that makes um, a safer online experience for all users. Uh, new transparency obligations, online advertising obligations, protection of minors, and also uh, avoiding manipulate manipulation of um, users' choices during uh, through those um, algorithms that are used right now by online uh, platforms. Um, also, it will have a very important co um, component of um, how the uh, online platforms have to comply with stricter obligations and um, mitigate um, significant societal risks that they pose when disseminate illegal and harmful content, including disinformation and uh, incitement uh, via the uh, internet. Uh, so the <clears throat> systemic risks will be diminished with these measures. And especially in times of crisis, um, is it um, war or public health or other crises, the European Commission may, may require very large platforms to limit urgent um, threats on, on its platforms. So uh, these are small measures. Um, but uh, maybe some, again, might say they are a bit late, but uh, at least I think we are moving the right direction as the European technology and uh, cyber policy community or digital policy community, however you want to call us. And, um, and hopefully we will have um, uh, also the possibility that the internet and the digital platforms are not just um, uh, 
uh, domains where um, mm, it will be easy to incite more uh, fragmentation in our democratic societies. But it will be, um, I shouldn't say more control, because we have to be very careful of uh, falling into the trap of digital authoritarianism. But um, at least we could um, make the online platforms um, uh, as democratic and transparent as we would have it otherwise in our uh, paper um, newspapers and other um, news media uh, sites. Uh, so I'll stop here and maybe we can come back to the questions about how technology is uh, sometimes also dangerous for the future of democracy later on. Thank you. Thank you. Right, pressing straight on, um, Dr. Sam Foles is an author, educator and barrister specialising in constitutional and international law and human rights. He's the director of the Institute for Constitutional Research and is a member of Cornerstone Barristers and a lecturer at St Edmund Hall University of Oxford. Sam was part of the team that successfully took the Prime Minister to court for illegally proroguing Parliament. Most recently, he served as counsel to the all-party parliamentary group on democracy and the Constitution's inquiry into judicial independence, which concluded that populist attacks on judges are undermining our democratic constitution. Sam's recent book, Overruled, Confronting Our Vanishing Democracy in Eight Cases, was described as a fascinating insider account of the complex and opaque British legal system and a timely warning about the steady erosion of British democracy at the hand of unaccountable elites. He also worked on high-profile cases against the Metropolitan Police and the Post Office. As a media commentator, Sam has appeared regularly on BBC Business, BBC World and Al Jazeera. We're delighted he's here to talk to us about populism in the UK, democracy and the disenfranchised. My mum gave my book a really good review. I'm, I'm glad that was, uh, that was added. Um, I've got to say, when I was... Uh, uh, I've, I've been sort of sitting here and I've listened to what Michael uh, said about the, uh, the Ukraine and what Jaroslav has said about Poland, that I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say about the UK that is, is possibly in the same league or class or category or whatever as that? And then, you know, I get this introduction. I'm reminded that actually two years ago, our government literally shut down Parliament in the UK. Um, my view, though, is not necessarily that the UK is turning into Hungary or Poland or, or any other uh, state, but actually uh, we're in danger of regressing to an earlier and less democratic version of ourselves. And actually ma mass participatory liberal democracy is actually a historical anomaly in the UK. For most of our history, we were governed by monarchs or oligarchs, and it's only actually been just about 100 years where most people in the UK have been allowed to vote. But I don't actually want to talk about today the case of, a, of shutting down Parliament and the prorogation. What I think is more interesting in the, when we're thinking about populism in the far right is the reaction to that case. Because we, you know, we got the Supreme Court's decision and we walked out of that court very cocky, thinking we'd done this brilliant thing and thinking that God, this, you know, this must be a turning point, right? And naturally, because we're lawyers, we thought, well, we'd better have a drink. Um, and, and so we got in a taxi, and the first thing that, the ta that happened was the taxi driver yelled at us and said, the British people will never forgive you for what you've done. And I was a bit shocked about that, because to be honest, I thought, well, all I've done is carried leading council's bags, so I don't know what he's saying to me. Um, <laughs> But it goes to something deeper and more problematic, which for me is the heart of the populist discourse in the UK, and that thing is bullshit. Um, now, bullshit is a fun swear word, but it's also a, a theory of discourse that, was, uh, that a, a chap uh, called Henry Frankfurter came up with at Princeton. And it means a discourse in which your objective is to convince regardless of the truth. A liar, as a lawyer, right, it's very easy to cross-examine a liar because ultimately you're always going to get them. 
it's impossible to cross-examine a bullshitter because they have no concept of or no interest in what the truth may or may not be. And that is what has come to dominate our, uh, our public discourse in the UK. It was a fascinating survey by Ipsos Mori that said, that with, the, with the headline, UK public wrong about nearly everything. <laughs> <laughs> and despite this, this seeming like a joke, it, they had the data to back it up. And every significant issue from teenage pregnancy to immigration, the UK public thinks the facts of the issue are massively different to what they actually are. And that's where populism comes in, because we, we've heard populism described as the, uh, a conflict between you know, the people and the elite, and the elites being the baddies in populism. But in the UK, who is the single greatest political beneficiary of po uh, populism? It's Boris Johnson. Who's the great, arguably the greatest media beneficiary? It's Nigel Farage. The greatest um, political pa party beneficiary is the Conservative Party. The beneficiaries of populism in, in the UK are almost all quasi-aristocrats, the archetype of the establishment of the elite. And the reason they are able to benefit from uh, this populist discourse is because they embrace the bullshit. Um, and a really good example of this is what you know, we've been talking about as a, as a nation for the past week, um, which is the Rwanda deportations. Um, and so we have a government that has run the country for, what, getting on for 13, 14 years now? 14 years in which our economy has either consistently stagnated or been in recession, in which poverty has massively increased, in which communities have been disenfranchised. And so it's, it's no wonder people are angry. It's no wonder working class communities want to turn to populism and are pissed off with the elites. But instead of taking their frustration out on the people whose policies have consistently failed, um, they are encouraged to take their frustration out on the vulnerable, on outgroups that we can identify and create as internal enemies. And the internal enemy du jour at the moment is immigrants. And so we are told repeatedly that actually all of our, this, this poverty is the result not of deflationary economics and, uh, and, and austerity, but of migrants crossing the channel. Incidentally, the reason that migrants cross the channel is because governments have shut off every lawful route to immigration in the UK uh, from, uh, from abroad. So the, the, the crisis that this Rwanda policy is supposed to solve was created by the very people that are now uh, pursuing the, this policy to solve it. And by focusing all this, uh, all this anger on, on this invented enemy, and then on the elites that are supposedly helping them, including myself as a uh, activist lawyer, which is uh, as what, what I've been repeatedly described as. Incidentally, if you're an activist lawyer, you're a bad lawyer, because your job as a barrister is not to be an activist, it's to win the case. And this is what I tell all of my clients. I'm not, I'm, if you're looking for an activist, go elsewhere. If you're looking to get the win here, well, then let's do all we can. Um, but we're portrayed as somehow pursuing this, uh, this political activist agenda. Um, and this brings us to the far right, because governments, in order to force this discourse and create this internal uh, idea of an internal enemy in immigrants and lawyers or whatever, have adopted far right discourses. And these far right discourses, and they are ideas that you see in the so-called manifestos of mass shooters in the United States and in New Zealand and in, the, um, uh, in, in, in Europe, um, are being adopted as a standard common part of UK means mainstream discourse. And so we hear ideas like the great, great replacement theory, which was you know, what motivated uh, the recent Buffalo shooter, for example. Um, which is this idea that through a coalition of liberals and, frankly, Jews, 
the white majority in the West is being replaced by immigrants. Um, and this is a theory that we see repeated by um, leading political commentators in the, in the UK who receive mainstream platforms. It's a, a theory we saw repeated a lot at the uh, Conservative Political Action Conference in Hungary that Michael mentioned, at which one of the significant speakers was Lord Wharton, who is the chair of the Office for Students, which is the regulator for universities in the UK. Lord Wharton has recently been granted powers uh, to force universities to platform particular speakers that the government approves of and to shut down any student or academic criticism of those speakers on, on campus. But we also see cabinet ministers embracing these tropes. Sorella Braverman um, recently talked about cultural Marxism, which is, a ver a, a, again, a version of this great replacement theory and uh, a, an anti-Jewish conspiracy theory. Nadine Dorries uh, tweeted uh, information about it. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, tw uh, retweeted um, ideas put forward by the leader of uh, Alternative for Germany, which is a generally considered to be a far-right organisation. And all of these have a genuine political aim, which is first to... And it's an anti-democratic political aim. One is to distort the discourse. So rather than holding P uh, politicians accountable for their policy failures, we... Uh, blame that on, a, on a, some sort of outgroup and then cheer when those same politicians go through some sort of performative cruelty towards that outgroup, like the Rwanda deportations. But also, it's to uh, create an excuse to alter our constitution to further strip ordinary people of power. And we see that in the Rwanda uh, discourse. Because once the European Court of Human Rights said the not unreasonable thing, which was, government, please wait until you find out this policy is legal before you, before you do it, which seems to me to be not particularly radical. But this has been used as a pretense for talk about removing the Human Rights Act and even withdrawing from the European Convention, which is not some sort of dramatic defense of sovereignty. It's removing rights from ordinary people and allowing the executive to do what it wants more often without oversight. That's the result of bullshit, which is more authoritarianism and a, a slide towards a Victorian England where democracy was a pipe dream. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And now if we move straight on to uh, Vitalina Shevchenko, uh, who is a fourth year BA student in international economy at the uh, Kharkiv National University in Ukraine. She's a student's rector and represents almost 20,000 students at her university. Vitalina is also a young European ambassador working to help raise awareness about the EU's cooperation with its Eastern partner countries and contributing to policy dialogue on various topics, helping to increase civic activism and working together for a better future. Her main aim is to encourage young people to take part in the decision-making process at all levels. We're privileged to have her with us to talk about the impact of the Ukrainian invasion on young people and students and what Europe can do. Take it away. Thank you. First of all, I want to uh, I want to tell you that I'm glad to be here and uh, Thank you for the opportunity to share the um, voice of Ukrainian youth. Uh, as a student representative, uh, it's, it's really a nice opportunity for me and for Ukrainian youth in general. Um, our president, Volodymyr Zelensky, likes to say that uh, Ukrainian youth, don't, never tell that Ukrainian youth is a future. Ukrainian youth is Ukraine's today because we are those who build this country, who are going to rebuild it then. We are those who uh, create startups and um, contribute to the development in general. 
and before full-scale invasion, Russian full-scale invasion, everyone, as every Ukraine, Ukrainian teenager, as any European one, had uh, their own goals, their own plans. Um, somebody wanted to join a new NGO or start their career ladder process, you know, uh, or launch a new educational project. However, after full scale invasion, um, we haven't lost the hope to do all that that we plan that we have planned to do. And uh, moreover, I like the phrase that there is no rule book how to behave yourself during the war. And that's true. I mean, nobody knows what is right, what is not, how, what's better to do. It's better to stay, it's better to flee, it's better to go to the territorial defense forces or to be a volunteer or to continue working and paying taxes and to support your country like this. Nobody knows and everybody was uh, in shock for a few, for some period of time. However, I'm so proud to tell that every student, every teenager in general, every Ukrainian really um, works for our victory. Of course, with the support of our neighbors with the whole Europe and the whole world. However, we, we also do, I mean, everybody in Ukraine right now is, is a part of this, not only of the war, but also of our future victory. And the, as a head of student council of my university, I uh, would like to share how we how we personally adapt, how we have adap adopted our, um, our work, what we have changed, because we used to um, create some educational projects to, of course, to support our students, represent their rights and protect, protect their rights and represent their interests, and we continue doing it. However, since the full-scale invasion, uh, and genders of the meetings of my team, of me and the uh, university, administ administration of university, and in general, agendas have changed dramatically. And um, like, I remember the first uh, meeting, and we have discussed that we have to provide our students who are left, who are still in Kharkiv with some basic necessities, like water, food, medicine. And it was so shocking. However, it, it was something that has to be because new reality, new uh, priorities, I would like, uh, I would say, however, we still um, want to continue educational process. And we understand that it's something that has to be, that has to continue because education and educated youth, educa educated um, adolescents are those who what well, are those who also contribute to to the development of our country in general. And some of my mm, European colleagues and friends ask, but you still continue studying at university and passing exams and writing your thes thesis or whatever. <laughs> and uh, the answer is yes. And uh, here I would like to express the gratitude and the, pr the proudness of some of our teachers and students who continue doing it even though some of them are on temporary occupied territories. Some of them are still in Kharkiv, some of them abroad, and there is no connection or the connection is really low. However, we continue, I mean, everybody is trying to keep working, to keep living, going, because we understand that one day it's better to not to, 
stop, not to freeze the, your life here. We have to continue. And uh, that's something that I'm extremely proud of uh, that we continue doing. And uh, the thing that Europeans, I mean, I, I, I will talk about the, the same people, the, 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 just simple youth, adolescents, teenagers in Europe, what do they can do, right, to support Ukraine, to country, also to contribute if they want to be with us, to help us. And that's not that difficult that it may seem, because uh, the most important that I th from my point of view, is to show your government your opinion that you stand with us for what uh, sanctions are you vote for, you vote, uh, in, or you don't vote, or that you support us. Also, of course, to sh in general, to share information about the war and not to let us forgotten that um, because the war is the news and everything, everybody is can, may be a bit of tired of it, but that's really important not to let us forgotten and to keep going, to keep helping, supporting, and the world is still talking about us, and we are really, really grateful for that. Um, so probably that's all that I want to for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for being with us, Vitalina. Um, I think I'll move straight to questions from the audience now. Um, if we could have a show of interested hands, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry, oh, there's a microphone on its way. <laughs> what, are, what are the main tools that we can use to uh, continually challenge the slide amongst world governments to, to try and halt what the lawyer was talking about there, the slide <laughs> into, like, it's like a kind of a race to the bottom, you know, amongst world leaders. I mean, what, what mm. can we do? What can I do or people here do to... Um, I say I'm really enjoying being referred to solely by the definite article. I've been the Brit and the lawyer. <laughs> um, for, for me, uh, I think the most uh, important thing that can be done is to, is to give your, uh, your support to and, and work with the, uh, the organisations that are, um, are resisting this, uh, this, this backslide um, for, from democracy. So, for example... Um, and, and this is, I mean, more than, I don't, if you can give a donation to them, then, what, then wonderful, but not just that. If it's, you know, if you can attend their events, if you can go on social media, if you can, can write, that's all, all of that's fantastic. So organisations uh, like the Good Law Project, which is doing, I, arguably is a, in a strange situation because I'm not sure I'm convinced about the, whether crowdfunding public law litigation is an ideal thing. But actually, it's the only way you can do public law litigation at the moment, because otherwise it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. So organisations like that, organisations um, uh, like Reclaim These Streets, um, which, uh, which organise protests around um, the, the Metropolitan Police's uh, actions uh, towards Sarah Everard. That's really important. The other really important thing is to vote, uh, is to, to write to your MPs on... Um, uh, when these, these new issues are going through Parliament. And there is nothing more that some MPs hate than getting loads and loads and loads of letters um, because it forces them to get up and speak about this and, and engage with the, with the issue. And we saw, for example, this time last year, the Labour Party were not in a place where they were actively opposing um, immigration policies. And people 
got really annoyed about that and wrote to them and badgered Labour MPs across the board. And actually, I think Labour's response to Rwanda has been, been relatively good. Um, so that did make a change. And, and so the more you're in touch with your elected representatives, letting them know that things like that the, the back, these backsliding policies are not acceptable, the, the absolute better. I think um, I'll ask the same question to the other members of the panel. What can we do? So if I go to Michael first. Um, <clears throat> those are good answers. I, I think I would uh, use uh, the phrase uh, bullshit, the technical term. Mm. Um, I, I think one of our, our challenges as Democrats is to have very good bullshit detectors and not, not withdraw. I mean, one of the responses that you have to mendacity lying uh, as a constant practice in politics is just to withdraw, you know, cultivate your garden, get away. But, but I think one of the enormous strengths of British democracy is somebody who's lived here and now doesn't live here and comes back, is just how angry you are. Um, and that seems to be enormously productive, actually. Don't stay angry. Stay, keep your bullshit detectors on. At a more, you know, at a more intellectual level, part of what I was trying to say to you is, is there is to accept and live with the reality that democracy is constant conflict, argument, and debate, not only about issues, but about what democracy is. And then you've got to clarify for your own, for your own use what democracy is to you. I've given you my line, which is that it's majority rule balanced by minority rights to keep the people free, right? <laughs> you know, it's a package of things, and, and so, Cheap attacks on the media are ultimately destructive of democracy. Attacks on university autonomy and freedom by mendacious politicians are ultimately an attack on the institution whose purpose is to validate knowledge and, for, or, and train people to uh, be good citizens in our society. Um, and so you want to have your bullshit detectors on you want to stay angry, and you also want to know in your guts what it is you're fighting for, what kind of Britain you want. And at the core of being British, it seems to me, has been a very, very stout, ancient, long, stubborn idea about democratic freedom. This is said to you as a colonial. <laughs> this is said to you as a Canadian. I mean, I don't want to get sentimental here, but you know, if you're you're out in the colonies a long way away where it's bloody cold, we owe you we owe you quite a lot. So don't lose it, don't screw it up. Okay, M a message of relative optimism. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll ask the same question to uh, to Heli Ben Yaroslav Ben Vitalina. So, Heli, um, what what can we do? Well, uh, I'm an Estonian, and I must say that in our society, we have quite good filters uh, when it mm. comes to uh, manipulation, propaganda, and so on, since we still remember how it used to be during the Soviet Union times. So. And uh, I think uh, I have seen also that in the Western European societies, those filters are now better, much better than five, six years ago. I, uh, I lived uh, in Belgium for 10 years. And, and worked in the European Union. And I think we, we have seen um, quite a bit of progress actually also in, in older democracies in terms of um, uh, setting up those um, societal filters. But of course, we, I think uh, we have to be just vigilant and also we have to um, diminish the possibilities of those actors who would li uh, like to uh, sow discontent um, uh, in, in the society. And uh, I just can't, but I have to mention that to my uh, great disbelief, I just um, discovered that uh, RTR Planeta and Russia 24 are still showing in some Western European capitals. 
because the um, satellite companies or cable companies haven't switched them off. I actually made a complaint uh, in one of the Berlin hotels about this. And I got a reply that um, since it was only part of the six package of the European Union, <laughs> uh, the um, companies in Europe uh, do not have to be obliged you know, to remove those information sources. But since those channels are in Russian and not in English, like was the Russia today, people just didn't care. And I think this is a very good example how uh, we have still a very long way to go. People in co private sector, the cable companies, they don't care. They could have switched it off as the corporate social responsibility and they don't care. Mm -hmm. That's why I think we still have to work on this and we have to educate the uh, elites first. And then also, of course, in universities, we have a great role to educate the new elites. But um, let me say that we also have to educate the old elites that are already mm. there in our European yeah. initiative. Please. Thank you. Thank you. And Yaroslav, what can we do? Well, <laughs> I think that we share one problem that I tend to call populistainment. Uh, for a reason, mm. there was something that happened in many countries at the same time. You have Johnson, mm. there was Trump, we have Kaczynski. And I believe that one thing that we should be conscious, that at least from our perspective, I believe it is of importance, is that we have these societies of dopamine and entertainment and mm. distraction. And <clears throat> In liberal populists, they very often they don't use social media. Very often they are like sitting somewhere behind the scenes and they are working in the long run. Mm. I think that we should take it into consideration because at least what I would propose is to be always at the mode of, you know, two, two modes of action. One is that we should be activists and therefore be ready to work on everyday basis. But at the same time, we should know that there are guys who are thinking in terms of not elections, but five years, 10 years, 15 years, and they are very patient. Kaczynski, Putin, they don't have Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. It should be taken seriously. Mm. Mm. They are thinking in other terms. This is like, okay, so let them uh, let them fight. And there are some data that people feel not only exhausted, but fulfilled with some online, online fights. That will not do. You mm. could see it. I think that the war in Ukraine is a huge lesson of humbleness for us, because it shows that we are talking about something serious. And to, 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 to conclude, I set up an NGO in Poland, and it also means that you have to be ready to pay a price for it. I mean, there are some unpleasant things that may happen to those who are activists who would like to act. And honestly, it's not fun anymore when you have a liberal government and some kinds of harassment are serious ones. So mm. let's keep this part of seriousness in us and fight in the long run. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Vitalina, have you got any thoughts about what we can do? Oh, well, just to add to everyone, uh, I also think that the main key is in education, basically. Education uh, in all, on the all, in each level, yeah. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <laughs> I uh, would not begin to, to disagree with that. Now, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close there, I'm afraid. I'm sorry we haven't had time to move on to more questions, but we had such rich presentations. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming today. Um, it's been a pleasure to engage in such a thought-provoking discussion, um, and I'm sure we'll all be thinking more about this, and particularly on the suggestions uh, of our panellists about what we can do to prevent or try and halt the slide towards the radical right. Um, 
I think we'd all like to thank our panellists here and online with one last round of applause. And do, do follow the festival on Twitter and on Facebook and Instagram for updates. There's still lots of lovely rich events to going on in this great celebration of all that is cerebral. Um, if you've enjoyed this, in this session, please tell your colleagues, your friends. They can look at it on YouTube in the coming days. Yes. <laughs>